I want to thank our panelists for joining today and all of our attendees for uh, joining as well. My name is Rami Lote, and I work at the FedEx Institute of Technology located on the main campus of the University of Memphis. As you all know, COVID-19 has had a massive impact on our economy globally. And the reason we wanted to host this session from the Institute's point of view was we wanted to see what the local impact was like and what the local recovery will look like, less so on a macro, but more on a micro scale. And we're lucky today to be joined by four panelists from a diverse group of uh, and influential groups around the city. Uh, we have Ted Townsend, who's with the University of Memphis. He's the Chief Economic Development and Government Relations Officer. Uh, Ernest Strickland, who is the Senior Vice President of Work Workforce Development for the Greater Memphis Chamber of Commerce. And then we're lucky to have two members from the City of Memphis. First is Joanne Massey, who's the Director of the Office of Business Diversity and Compliance. And last and certainly not least is uh, Mr. Calabese, who is with um, the mayor's office. He's the deputy chief operating officer for the city of Memphis. Um, I wanted to give a little more background on what the Institute does as well for many of those who don't know what the FedEx Institute of Technology is. We are a joint collaboration between the FedEx, between FedEx, excuse me, and the University of Memphis located on the main campus of the University of Memphis. Um, we focus as an advanced technology and research organization which we're looking to um, become a catalyst or we are a catalyst for interdisciplinary research in and in innovation in emerging technologies for the city of Memphis and the region as a whole. What we're looking to do from a three phase approach is looking at cutting edge technology research, emerging technology, workforce development trainings, and then just engagement within our tech community. And we do that through a number of myriad of, and a myriad of approaches and if you have more, interest or you want to learn more about the Institute, feel free to ask away in the chat box or visit our website memphis.edu slash FedEx. I'll give each of our panelists a minute or two to introduce themselves a little further if they wish to. Um, Ernest, I'll start with you. Hi, um, thanks for having me uh, and good morning to everyone. Um, again, Ernest Strickland, Senior Vice President of Workforce Development with the Greater Memphis Chamber. Um, we work to make sure that, you know, Simply, our community has a high quality skilled talent pipeline so that our companies can find the individuals that they need to perform the roles in those companies and that individuals can have uh, good paying jobs to have meaningful employment um, to take care of their families. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, Ted, we'll go next. Yeah, so I'm Ted Townsend. I serve the university, as Rami mentioned, uh, as the Chief Economic Development and Government Relations Officer. So our office is responsible for interfacing at all levels of government, uh, local, state, and federal, uh, advocating and advancing the mission of the university, hoping to find additional uh, collaborations and, and financial support uh, for all that we do enterprise-wide. Uh, we, we also focus on economic development. And uh, with that, we have the University Neighborhoods Development Corporation, which is our, our distinct university district, uh, where we promote and, and try to attract um, additional economic development within uh, the footprint of the university. And uh, most recently, we launched the University of Memphis Research Foundation Research Park. Uh, so UMRF Research Park. Uh, which has uh, uh, recruited and attracted uh, companies that are coming from advanced industry sectors that have inherent ties to the, the research enterprise on campus. Uh, we've had great success there. <clears throat> the 10,000 square foot phase one facility is, is nearly full. And, uh, and so what, what we're striving to do is attract that type of uh, public and private support uh, for growth in, in the district where companies are creating high quality jobs for our students. Great, great. And the Institute was, a, was an instrumental part in getting the uh, research park off the ground, but Ted's division has taken it over and done great with it. So we're very, very happy with phase one and look forward to the next phases of the research park. Um, Joanne, next. All right, thank you, Rami. Um, thank you for having me here. As Rami said, my name is Joanne Massey. I'm the director for the Office of Business Diversity and Compliance for the City of Memphis. We serve as the central resource and service center for locally owned small businesses. 
we actually serve businesses in the Memphis MSA. Uh, so we, we stretch out to counties in Mississippi as well as Arkansas. Our main mission is to support small businesses in accessing opportunities to bid on city contracting, as well as uh, building capacity to bid competitively for private sector opportunities. Um, we work really closely with a lot of our partners, of course, Ernest Strickland here, um, as well as Ted in the University of Memphis, Epicenter, Starco, and the list goes on. But um, our main focus is helping to grow small businesses in our community and helping them to contribute to the greater economy. Excellent. And again, certainly last but not least is Kyle. Yeah, I appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, again, my name is Kyle Beasy. I'm the Deputy Chief Operating Officer uh, for the City of Memphis, serving Mayor Strickland and our Chief Operating Officer, Doug McGowan, whose office is uh, two doors down right here. Um, I, my job is, uh, I love it. It's unique. Uh, it sort of works in a number of different swim lanes. I tend to sum it up as um, projects, policy, and um, economic development. And um, particularly in that second or in that third part, uh, I am by no means the Chief Economic Development Officer of Memphis. We have a great one, Reed Dolberger. Uh, the Chamber does great work, Joanne does great work, and Ted does great work. What I think that um, what the Mayor asked me to bring to the table was to be sort of a connective tissue and how uh, we can connect uh, City Hall um, more cleanly with all those organizations. So um, I do a lot of work with uh, companies that are um, that are looking to locate here or locating here uh, on infrastructure needs and sort of any, any interactions they have with City Hall to sort of be more of a proactive um, um, handoff as opposed to reactive. So that's the work that, uh, that I'm involved in every day and, um, and I appreciate the chance to talk to you about it. Great, and uh, yeah, again, thank you all for joining and participating. I had a question to kick off right off the top of my head, but um, based off the little conversation, Ted, you and I were having right before, I actually want to cede the floor to you if you want to share the news from the legislative session that ended last night or early this morning. If you want to go ahead and share that news with everybody. Yeah, sure. Happy to do so, Rami. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm thrilled with this. Uh, obviously, the, the Tennessee General Assembly 111th uh, called sine die, as they say, at 3.15 a.m. this morning. Um, but, um, you know, they're obviously facing a lot of pressures with the, the, the economy and the impact of COVID-19. Um, it, it really hit higher education and all of us, right? Uh, so we were originally in Governor Lee's budget, a recommended budget, um, to include funding for our STEM research and classroom building, as well as uh, five million non-recurring for research, which was uh, going toward our pursuit to becoming a Carnegie R1 research institution uh, nationally. And um, uh, we were really proud in that, uh, despite the March version of the uh, stripped out budget that they passed, um, and then even coming back and, and uh, seeing what the, the impact is after a couple of months on the, the state's economy, uh, we were really happy to have support in the legislature for the STEM building. Uh, they, uh, the House actually put it in their budget amendment, and uh, that was on Wednesday. And, uh, and they selected two of the four projects that Governor Lee had recommended. Uh, the TCAT in Chattanooga focused on advanced manufacturing and the University of Memphis STEM research and classroom building uh, at $32.9 million. Um, so it, it obviously there was uh, a day worth of uh, negotiations and, uh, and the Senate passed that um, in right around midnight last night. Um, there are three different components of the bill. You have appropriations, the implementation of the budget, and the bond bill, the bond bill reflecting those two projects that I mentioned. In the Senate, uh, it was unanimous, uh, 29 votes in favor, no, no votes. Um, and in the House, when they picked it up about 30 minutes later, uh, passed all three um, at 12.36 a.m. And uh, the bond bill received 91 ayes and no no's. So what I mentioned to Rami is that uh, you, you saw statewide 
bipartisan, unanimous support of this investment that is going to be critical to the recovery of, of Memphis's economy. Um, so we're, we're grateful and, and thrilled, albeit uh, sleep deprived uh, this morning. <laughs> Burning the midnight oil, as they say. Um, yes. Ted has a lot more strength than I do to stay up until about 3 a.m. to watch le legislative sessions. So thank you for being <laughs> on the path Ted. We really appreciate that. And that's great news. I mean, I, I know he was sharing some of the st statistics beforehand with regards to, you know, how it's going to increase enrollment, graduation rates, create a better base of applicants for jobs, and a better pool for jobs for local employees around the city. So that's amazing. Um, with regards to something you brought up in with R1, how has COVID, uh, excuse me, how has COVID impacted um, our goal to attain Carnegie Research Level 1 status? Um, and with the STEM building, how will that improve our chances of getting to that level? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think that we are fortunate in that over the last several years, the administration and, and now our independent board of trustees is focused on operational efficiencies and to, uh, under Dr. Dhaliwal's leadership, to create this culture of research on campus, recognizing the importance of this. Um, the, the moonshot was Carnegie R1. Uh, that's been a pursuit for the last few years. And we understood that nationally, uh, universities that were, were R1, uh, you know, the, the return on investment was estimated at four to one. And uh, so we, we wanted to drill into that a little bit more. Um, but we, we also recognized that 85 to 95 percent of R1 institutions have a research or tech park. U of M did not have one. So we've, we've uh, uh, been successful at launching ours. And, um, and so you've also seen a 70% increase in research expenditures on campus in the last 12 months alone. So uh, the, the culture shift has, has taken shape. Uh, it, it has been adhered to and enthusiastically supported, not just in STEM fields, but, but in education and, and other colleges and schools on campus. Um, and, and those expenditures have mattered. Uh, the addition of postdocs and, and research personnel, all of these are, are uh, incrementally improving the economy despite the pressures that, that COVID has placed. Um, you know, we've uh, we actually implemented fully online instruction uh, in a week and a half. Uh, I think that, is, that success is based on the fact that we've been providing online instruction over uh, two decades and have been a leader and nationally recognized for our own online instruction. Um, so we're, we're thrilled with the position that we've been in. Um, this investment from the state only helps to continue that pace and, and in fact, in my opinion, help accelerate it. Uh, and it's not just getting to R1, it's sustaining it and, and keeping that investment uh, uh, coming. So uh, I, while we fully expect uh, there are to be additional pressures. Uh, you know, we know the STEM building is going to represent construction uh, economic impact, and we've got that uh, reflected in our uh, recent economic impact analysis report that we launched uh, last week. Um, so we feel that that you know our role as a university is to continue to contribute, and uh, we feel that we're in a position to do that despite the the uh, the pandemic. Great. That's great to hear. And just kind of following off of that one, I'll open it up to the entire group. What are some initiatives that local Memphians can take during this time if their businesses have, while everyone has been impacted in some way, whether it's, you know, a work from home type situation or more deeply impacted with their business closing down or temporarily shuttering, what are some initiatives that we can take as Memphians to kind of raise up those who are struggling in these times of needs and Joanne and Kyle, we'll, I can start with either one of you, whoever wants to take it first. Well, you know, the things that, the things that I think about when you ask that question are hardly revolutionary, but I think that this is a time where um, the basics matter. And I think it, it is very important to support local businesses with our dollars and our foot traffic. Um, and that includes everything from me getting takeout from the restaurant that's next door to my house to uh, the B2B world, particularly in the B2B world, right? Um, and then one thing that, you know, one thing we have at our, all of our disposals 
again, hardly revolutionary. So I'm not going to blow you away here, but we all have our own channels to share that, uh, that we, you know, we didn't have 15 years ago or whatever it may be. And so I'm a big believer in, in you can, uh, you can provide the free advertising and, and, and help, um, help raise awareness. Your dollar matters and your voice matters to, to bring people, um, to bring people around. And I think that this, I didn't plan this as a clean segue to jo Joanne, but it's going to be uh, with Buy901 and the work that uh, the database that, uh, that her office has with our certified contractors um, is another great opportunity to start. Uh, well, thanks, Kyle. Um, that's, that is a great segue, so thank you very much. Um, the Buy901.net website has a um, hundreds of locally owned certified small businesses. And so that's one way, Rami. Um, again, that website is by901.net for the um, attendees here. In addition to that, our office is focused on helping small businesses transition. This pandemic is um, a new normal for a lot of people, but it really truly is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for our community to change how we do business. As Kyle said, focusing on local small businesses, buying from your neighbors and working together is really important. For our business owners, it's a chance for them to look at their business operations and to look at how they can streamline, transition, or improve. There are so many opportunities that have come out of this pandemic, especially for business owners. And the city of Memphis has been focused on um, ensuring that we're buying local as much as possible. And this is a great segue to Ernest because the chamber has done a lot of work in identifying local businesses that we can purchase uh, personal protective equipment from. And so I'll turn it over to him. Great segue. <laughs> Definitely. Thanks for the, uh, the plug, uh, Joanne. Uh, but, you know, to the earlier point, right now is time to really support our local businesses. What we realized, the chamber realized early on was that there were going to be a lot of confusion. You know, what business is open, which business is closed, who has modified hours. And so all those uncertainties can potentially have a customer say, you know what, I'm just going to go on my phone and order something, you know, online. Uh, so we created the Open 901 Business Directory, which uh, provides a free listing um, uh, of all the area businesses uh, that remained open and those that had modified hours so that the community could know which businesses they could go to support. Uh, that link is located on our business resource page, our COVID-19 business resource page located on the Chamber website. And so, um, you know, in addition, today is June uh, 19th, which is a, a special day for African Americans in um, this country and for the country as a whole. And so, um, today is a good day to go out and support um, your, your black owned businesses. Um, in that same line of supporting local companies, minority companies really tend to struggle when there's um, something such as this magnitude that occurs that negatively impacts their businesses. So uh, today is a great day to go out and support local and support uh, black owned businesses. Rami, if I could take a moment to add to Ernest's comment. Um, yes, today is Juneteenth and one of our certified local business owner Cynthia Daniels and company is actually um, she actually put together a Juneteenth virtual shopping experience oh, wow. um, and as a matter of fact yesterday she was featured on CNN she's been interviewed across the nation uh, for doing this and so it's not too late for people to join it's an all weekend event uh, kind of like, you know, the Black Fridays that we have for the tax-free shopping. 
but you can Not shop. Mass shoppers, you know, like attacking each other, going at the door at 5 a.m. Right. Right? <laughs> yeah. right, nothing like that at all. Nothing like that. But um, you can go to Facebook and you can just um, search Cynthia Daniels and company and you'll see the Juneteenth virtual shopping experience. Um, black owned businesses both local and some across the country are participating in this and it's hundreds hundreds of businesses father's day is fast approaching so happy early father's day to ted and ernest for sure and to kyle and his puppies um <laughs> so you can definitely shop um during the juneteenth virtual shopping experience with cynthia daniels Great, great. Thank you for mentioning all that. And if you want to share any of the links to this goes to the panelists or any of the attendees, any links to anything that they've mentioned, please, please feel free to do so. We'd love to, uh, to promote those out. Um, and Ernest, I wanted to follow up with you on one point. You know, with supporting local businesses, how has investment during these last three, four months from outside sources for major projects or even minor projects or projects of any size? stayed within the Memphis area? Has it increased? Has it remained steady? Have, you, have we seen a decrease? And what is kind of the, the outlook? I know that the global economy, you know, took a beating these last three, four months. What can we expect? Because I know over the last, gosh, eight years, there's been, I think, a couple billion dollars, dollars worth of investment in the Memphis, greater Memphis area. What can we see going forward for the next, say, 18 months? Okay, so, so I'll start um, kind of nationally. Uh, there's a um, organization that we are um, members of, the chamber is a member of uh, Site Selectors, um, and they have what's called the Site Selectors Guild. In April, they took a survey of their members, and these are economic development professionals uh, from all across the, the country, and they work on projects all over the globe. 52% uh, of those surveyed indicated that projects will be placed on pause uh, in the near term. And so nationally, we're foreseeing a lot of projects being placed on hold. As we like to say, uncertainty is the enemy of capital investment. And that 52% uh, indicates how uncertainty is really um, causing um, projects to, to really come to a, a halt and a pause. Luckily in Memphis, we have um, very resilient um, industries, manufacturing and, and logistics. And very true yeah. work is actually up uh, year over year. So for 2020 to date, uh, we have landed 1,421 new jobs and we've retained 105 jobs, uh, representing a capital investment of about 500 million. Um, it's important to note that Amazon and UPS are captured in those numbers, you know, both very big projects. But just to give you a, a sense of uh, what I mean, last year this time, our um, economic development efforts had yielded 1,000 new jobs and 540 uh, retained jobs. And so the retained job number is definitely down, which is an expression of um, not a lot of expansion, mm -hmm. really. Uh, here in our market or nationally, but we are seeing uh, the logistics and e-commerce sector, uh, which we're very uh, much a driver in, uh, really maintain and thrive during these times, which is a good sign for our community. And Tommy, if I could add to that, um, and I appreciate Ernest. I'm glad you had those numbers because, you know, I. I spend a fair amount of time working with the chamber, working with Ernest's colleague, Susan, who's particularly on the, on the uh, interim uh, senior vice president of economic development, I think is probably your title. We all know her as Susan. Um, I spend a lot of time with her when there are potential projects coming down the pipeline. And, um, you know, we certainly saw the bump in the road uh, in March, but it did not dry up. And I think that's important for everyone to know um, that, uh, you know, far be it from me to, to project what someone who's about to invest millions in capital is thinking, but that you can deduce from that, that, that people are still viewing this as, you know, I think certainly a defining event, but not, um, 
not completely shifting their plans to invest in certain markets, particularly when it comes to, like you mentioned, manufacturing, um, we're, we're still seeing quite a bit. And so I think that, um, and I think that those who were, again, I was not, I was not even in this career field there, during the last um, recession, but I think that people who were uh, will tell you that the, uh, the attraction pipeline was a lot lower than it is right now. So we'll see how that bears out in three, six, nine, 12 months, you know, there's no prediction. But I have been encouraged to see uh, the level of activity that we still interact with. That's great. That gives you a lot of hope, you know, during these trying times because there's a lot going on. So any little bit of news, all you know, any good news that we can gain during this time is really good. So that's great. Um, Joanne and, and Kyle, I'll pose this to you because, Joanne, you mentioned your office works kind of within a, a, the Mid-South region here. Um, one of our researchers here on the U of M campus, Dr. Charlie, Charles Santo, <clears throat> he mentioned that um, COVID has no borders. It doesn't recognize state borders, local borders, whatever have you. And that's pretty evident with how many cases are, are worldwide, you know, and has the local, or ha have local officials been working with, you know, regional partners or regional governments or um, even local governments to say, hey, you know, this is what, what's working in your area. Is it something that we can do here? Or is it just kind of like, you know what, we've got, we've got so much going on in our plate, we can't really focus on like, hey, what's, you know, Olive Branch doing? What is Jackson doing? What is Nashville doing, et cetera? Questions like that. Yes, um, quite a bit, in fact. Um, and I think part of the reason that, you know, part of the reason that, um, I may be here is because of the role that I played on the joint task force. And I wanted to kind of, if I could spend a few seconds talking about that, because I think it helps answer your question. Uh, in mid-March, when, when we realized that COVID-19 was um, going to, you know, shake every aspect of life, uh, the city and the county mayors came together and created the joint task force. Um, and it involves participation from the city of Memphis, Shelby County, every municipality in Shelby County, um, Tipton County, uh, Lauderdale County, Haywood County, the mayor of Brownsville is on most mornings when we have our, our call, uh, West Memphis, uh, to a degree to Soto County, um, the hospital systems, which um, are pulling in data from their uh, systems in the Soto County and, and elsewhere. I say all that to say, um, what an amazing template for collaboration that this has forced us, frankly, to, to tackle. And uh, I've told people more than once, I can't wait to pick up this model and this spirit of collaboration and apply it to something fun. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, right now we're, we're tackling something very difficult, but we, we are tackling it and coming at it from every uh, imaginable way. We, we have, um, so, so my entry point into the task force was to be the lead on uh, basically how uh, uh, it intersected with business and commerce. And early that was a lot of um, conversations about where can we identify PPE, what local manufacturers um, can help us with that. Some very early triage, right? Um, pretty much a couple weeks in, two or three weeks in, shifted a little bit more into what are our business um, assistance programming, grants, forgivable loans, et cetera, that I'm sure Joanne can can uh, recite in her sleep because she helped create them and has been knee deep in that work. And then about uh, mid April, the work, it, at least in my little corner of the task force shifted into developing the policy for the, the back to business framework. So, and that's just one of about 16 corners of the task force. So from a collaboration standpoint, um, it has been, while this has been one of the, well, one of, while this has been the most trying um, time of most everyone's career up here, it's also in some ways been the most heartening to see how everybody in Shelby County and frankly the region can come together and not worry about artificial boundaries and tr just try to get stuff done. Yeah, okay, great, 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 great. Joanne, I think you have, Kyle, pass it over to you. Yeah, and I'll add to that, you know, with the spirit of the task force and actually with Kyle's um, leadership, we developed a local, I guess, committee that's focused on small business, uh, community initiatives, um, 
Epicenter has played a vital role in that, as well as, of course, the Chamber. Uh, TED is a part of that committee as well, and many other organizations. And so we all come together and kind of on the micro level, identifying the needs of small businesses, ensuring that we're collaborating and in the know, because a lot of our clients, a lot of the businesses that we interact with are, you know, the same. And we wanna be sure that we have um, the, uh, the appropriate synergy and providing them with the knowledge so that they're not, um, you know, all over the place. I mean, with the pandemic and with what's happening, it can be very confusing, like Kyle said, to know where to go and what to do. And so on that micro level with businesses, we um, have formed that collaboration. And I also wanna add, um, Kyle mentioned about the grant programs and the loan programs and some other things that our office is doing in response to the pandemic. Truly, I can't take credit for all of that. I've been a part of a fellowship uh, with Living Cities and Kyle is a part of this as well um, for about the last three years or so. And so we took on um, conversations with cities like, you know, cities in New York, um, cities like Atlanta, uh, those in Chicago. So my counterparts, chief equity uh, or diversity officers in those communities, we have a weekly call where we discuss what's going on in our nation and what's going on in our local communities. And then taking best practice items and uh, figuring out how we can um, include those in our strategies locally. So I've been able to do that. So a lot of the things like the economic hardship um, loan fund um, and some of the business navigator things that we've done, those are things that came from that collaboration. So the key word is collaboration. Great. Yeah. And that's, I think that kind of goes without saying, but it's great to hear that. You don't hear a lot of that in the news. You know, you don't hear, okay, what are we doing? You hear, oh, the president has a call with all the governors or the governor may have, you know, the governor of Tennessee may have called with all the local mayors, you know, county city mayors, but it's great to see that we're all just going, okay, you know what, we're all in the same boat. Let's make sure the boat's going in the right direction. And we're all not trying to split the boat in 50 different ways, you know? Ernest, I wanted to touch on, yeah. did you bring something up or, or follow up on that point or? Say um, uh, the point about collaboration. Um, you would think that it happens uh, more often uh, because it should and not all the time. It's because people don't want to collaborate. It's just they're very resource rich at times. And there are a lot of organizations that are focused uh, we're a very giving community, and so everyone rolls their sleeves up to get the job done. Uh, but oftentimes, um, we end up duplicating efforts, or we end up um, not collaborating as, as much as we should. And so uh, in this environment, it is forcing us to over-communicate, which leads to increased collaboration. So as Kyle mentioned, I hope that we maintain um, this level and this new culture and take it into ways in which we can collaborate for um, more fun and, and more um, optimistic type of projects. Great. And yeah. I'll follow hey. up with you on that point, Ted, you know, how, how can higher ed be, uh, I'll let you speak on the collaboration part, but I wanted to follow up and mm -hmm. say, how can we as the University of Memphis become kind of a leader in this area, not fostering collaboration, but also just generally lead the way for as a model for other universities or other, you know, uh, other, the, you know, the city can sit there and say, look at, you know, look what the University of Memphis is doing and how, you yeah. know, this is a model going forward. Sure. Yeah. So on the collaboration piece, and, and I, I like what Ernest said about the over communication, I, I think the connectivity has afforded a lot of, uh, a lot of fortification of partnerships that we knew were there. Uh, but were, were activated in response to the pandemic. And, and one that I would cite is a, a public-private nonprofit collaboration uh, that addressed the Shelby County Schools uh, meal um, um, yeah. crisis uh, that they were facing uh, from this. And so the University of Memphis and its uh, uh, food services vendor uh, Chartwell's partnered with the YMCA, um, and and you know that collaboration is now manifest into delivering, I guess over uh, probably now reaching forty thousand 
meals per week. Um, they started out with lunch and they've added breakfast and uh, they started out Monday through Friday. They've added Saturday, Sunday. Um, so I, you know, I think that demonstrates the, the incredible need that our community has on something to Kyle's point earlier, that's very basic. Um, and, and, you know, the pandemic flipped this into a crisis mode, but, but for that collaboration, uh, I don't think that, that very basic and necessary, um, meal service would have been provided to our community and, and the folks that need it most. To me, what's revolutionary is getting to a point in economic recovery where that's a value add for these children and not a basic necessity. Um, to me, that's where I think we, we all need as leadership to be focused on creating an economy that uh, is sustainable for all and inclusive of all uh, so that a meal at school is not the only meal you get. And when you're hit with a pandemic, um, you know, the doubt and the question and the fear uh, starts to enter the parents and the children's minds of how am I going to eat today because I can't go to school. Right. So that's one that I, I think is, has been a shining example of, of collaboration in, in response to this. But, you know, that's one role a university can play. I, I think, uh, you know, our, our access uh, to the, the corporate community and the partnerships that we forge uh, through our, our corporate strategy council um, along with, you know, just the, the, like the FedEx Institute of Technology being an innovation hub, it's, there's an expectancy of, of these types of, of partnerships that I feel will continue to drive uh, our, our response to this uh, crisis, but, um, but also to build this foundation of resiliency uh, that will ensure the recovery. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I hope that answers your question. I have a lot of other examples where the university's uh, driving that, but you know, the, just the the report that we issued alone, we're, uh, you know, we're a we're yeah, a billion the, dollar exactly. economic driver. We're talk a little yeah. bit on that if you'd like to, yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I think what it demonstrates is is like I mentioned, we we are a billion dollar economic driver uh, to uh, not only the Memphis and regional economy, but to the state, and. Uh, you know, nearly 10,000 jobs are supported by the university. And, and uh, you know, the, the wages that uh, those jobs represent is, is $2 billion in the last five years. So, uh, you know, with, with the, the over 400 academic degree and certification programs that we offer the community, uh, we truly are that, that driver of workforce. Uh, we are delivering the absolutely critical human capital and talent uh, that this market deserves and needs and I feel will um, absolutely be the, the, the center of, of growth and innovation uh, for decades to come. Um, so goes Memphis, so goes the University of Memphis and vice versa. Uh, so a strong university represents what I feel is a, a, a strong uh, localized economy. And I want to follow up on that point when you mentioned talent, um, and I'll pose this to the to all the panelists. Do you believe during these times, you're, you know, a lot of large and small employers have told employees, you know, we're now shifting to a work from home model. Do you think this will drive us to have more local talent being looked at more closely, or do you think companies will still go, okay, you know, we'll look around the region or nationally to hire more talent, or will they look at it and go, you know what, if I can find everything I need here whether it's at the University of Memphis or other higher ed institutions or just generally within the population, you feel like COVID-19 has forced employers to rethink their hiring strategies or do you think they're just gonna go, you know what, we're just gonna keep business as usual and look all, all around like we have been. Ernest, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think um, this has definitely caused um, employers to just reimagine all processes, right? Um, what we found was, although there were several food, beverage, beverage uh, lodging uh, businesses that were unable to operate and several of their employees were uh, let go, uh, we saw a surge in local companies 
sharing with us job opportunities that they had and a need for immediate um, work. And so we populated our um, business resource page with what we call the immediate job opening page. We have over 50 companies that submitted um, job posting to us, uh, representing over 200 job postings. And they are looking for individuals right here in the Memphis market. Uh, they shifted their you know, hiring process to incorporate more virtual type of interviews. But I think um, HR managers are, are just reimagining how they source talent. Um, to one degree, it's a disadvantage because if you're working remotely mm -hmm. in Boston and still perform uh, the work that's needed for an employer right here in Memphis. But um, largely, I think um, the, the new way of uh, sourcing talent will be you know, looking close proximity first and expanding that reach um, as you're unable to find the individuals that you need for, for the job that you have. Great, great, yeah. And, and I would say, Rami, to that, you know, um, we certainly have seen a shift and I, I think there's consistent analysis from employers. Uh, we've talked to those that are in the research park, um, but you know, there, there is a, a certainty and confidence that is provided when you have a university that's uh, conferring over 4,500 4, degrees every year. And in fact, this last uh, virtual commencement, we had our, our largest graduating class ever in our history. Um, and, and what's interesting is that 70% of our graduates stay home. So they are, are contributing directly to the, the local economy through their talents. And, um, and so, you know, we know our, our tigers that get a bachelor's degree, you know, they, they earn nearly 10% more than uh, degrees from other area colleges even. Um, and and uh, the advanced uh, degree holders earn 22% more <clears throat> than their peers. So, um, so we feel that despite what this has forced employers to look at, they're going to look at home, like Ernest said first. They're going to start here. And, and knowing that we're producing at that volume, at that quality, I mean, our, our academic results are at their highest that they've ever been um, in our history. So, uh, so they're, we're producing a very high quality workforce. And um, so I, I think no matter what, if they go to a virtual model, if they have a hybrid, or they get back to normalized operations, um, the, the employment uh, uh, activity that, that's going to come out of that is, is going to be fully addressed by the university. Great, and then Kyle, Joanne, uh, posing the same question to y'all. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, Ernest and Ted are certainly far more uh, beyond me in terms of um, some of the workforce development issues there. I think that the one thing that came to mind when when you were asking the question is about is very early on, uh, gosh, early April probably. Um, you know, I was doing some check-in calls with some business leaders just to, to say hello and, and talk to one who uh, was in uh, was contact at a fairly large uh, employer in town, and uh, they'd sent all their employees home to work from home, and they now um, were wondering, hmm, how much how much of that should remain permanent? You know, how much of that function is going to stay the same? And um, I suspect that could actually spawn off another panel discussion with our friends in the commercial real estate business. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Above, above our pay grade a little bit, but um, <laughs> that's a real issue. And, yeah. and I think that the way it's changing work is undeniable. Well, Romy, I'll answer your question just broadly from a diversity and inclusion uh, lens. Here in our community, we have a, a large group of diverse professionals of all race and gender. And I think that when you look at us brain drain or sourcing our talent from outside of the city, I think that this offers an opportunity for companies to look inside 
and to try to, like Ted said, and I'm very familiar with the university, um, keeping our graduates here and keeping them employed. And not to say that we obviously don't want uh, talented people to relocate to Memphis, but we also want to make sure that we're hiring local as we're buying. And I, Kyle, to follow up on your point, you know, I have a, a couple of friends in that area in the commercial real estate area where they own their own businesses. And you think about the trickle down effect, not just in the commercial real estate, right? You have electricians, plumbers, people who, you know, physically build the buildings. There's the trickle down effect there. And then you've got, you know, people who are sourcing or, you know, actually delivering supplies. Like there's just such a trickle down effect that if major companies or even, you know, medium sized companies go, you know what, we're shifting the majority of our employees to work from home. Now there's no need for, you know, all the kind of lower income style jobs that lift, you know, entire people out of poverty or can help lift them up. And those jobs, you know, are the most threatened. So I'll pose this again, again, to the entire group. What are things we can do as, you know, in, in leaders in these areas to kind of help raise up those in underserved areas or um, those are in lower income areas? You know, those are the jobs and the people that are the most impacted right now. What are things that we can all do to kind of help those out in times of need? I, I know supporting local is great and all, but what are some of the things that people haven't thought about that we can really go out there and make a difference? Um, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, you know, more so than working remotely, uh, before COVID, uh, we started to see large investments in automation and robotics um, as those machines uh, decrease in price, more and more uh, companies will look to uh, purchase them in order to gain efficiency. So uh, a plug for the University of Memphis, we're working with uh, the university on a grant. <clears throat> it's a Delta Regional Authority, a grant to um, stand up a automation and robotics training uh, program. Yeah. Uh, yeah in conjunction with uh, Southwest Community College. But what that will provide is for individuals to look at automation and embrace it, to be able to have the skills needed to program the robots, to um, service the robots. And ultimately, as an economic developer, my hope is uh, to create such a concentration of talent here familiar with uh, those type of mechatronic uh, equipment and skills that we would attract those manufacturers of those robots to our marketplace to build them. And so, um, you know, it's all about skilled talent. You know, we, we say talent, but it's really about skilled talent. And the program that we're looking to stand up with the University of Memphis, um, aiming to increase the um, skills of robotics and automation in our marketplace, will help individuals enter into um, a good paying job space and also have um, the opportunity to advance with greater uh, skills, greater certifications and certificates. And so it's important for us to uh, look at our you know, role as America's uh, distribution capital and double down on that by attracting more manufacturing and taking advantage of the large number of investments that are taking place in robotics by having the talent here, um, as opposed to other uh, uh, places that would love it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, I think uh, that fits well, Ernest, with one of the questions that, that I just read from Milk Caps and Milk, thanks for being on. Uh, asking about you know those types of opportunities uh, for for tech innovation and one that I think is really exciting and is still moving forward despite the uncertainty in the economy is is the Union Row project, uh, which is 1.4 billion dollar development um, that that is uh, you know focused on hotels and uh, and office space. Um, and, and we're looking to leverage our smart city research cluster, uh, which hopefully will become a full institute in the, in the coming years uh, to be a major player in that. And I know we're partnering with the city of Memphis and the downtown Memphis commission and start co and the investors in the, in the project to 
uh, ensure that we're creating this digital city, the, the largest uh, smart city project of its kind in the nation. Um, so in addition to being that distribution capital, there's no reason why we Memphis can't be identified as the, the smart city capital um, in, in the next decade or the, the ag tech capital of the world as well. Um, and, and what's really great about that, you mentioned the, the underserved communities um, that have been disinvested uh, generationally. Um, what, what I love about the aspect of Union Row is it's focusing on this digital inclusion and turning on a, a, what we think is a basic utility, uh, but also a necessity for everyone, and that's broadband uh, to the South City neighborhood and others that I know have been targeted. Uh, Union Row is in an opportunity zone, which also speaks to Milt's uh, question. So they're pulling all of the levers to maximize the, the private investment that's being put in. And given the scale of this project and the fact that it is holistic, it's not just focused on putting up shiny gleaming buildings in, in the entryway to our downtown core, uh, but it's it's also focused on making sure the community feels the benefit of that and is brought along with it. So our students are going to act as digital mentors in partnership with uh, with others in the community who've been operating in that space. Um, it opens us up for EDA grants, and I know that there are a couple of those opportunities that that um, are in the near future as well, which we'll pursue as a collaborative. Um, but that's how I think you know, we continue to build that density of, of tech, innovation, workforce, and inclusion so that, that um, you know, we all benefit from this. Great, great. And I want to follow up with one point with regards to this, uh, the Smart Cities Research Cluster, but I'll let Kyle, you and Joanne go, and then I'll come back to that point. I don't have anything to add. I think Ted and Ernest covered it well. And, you know, of course, we're familiar with the Union Row project and working really closely and partnering with uh, Starco and uh, Kevin and those those folks. Yeah, and I think, I mean, workforce development is, is and was my answer to the question. And, you know, who am I to talk about workforce development when we got a pro like Ernest in the room? But I do think that, I do think that the thing that come up when I was listening to Ted talk about, um, you know, disinvested neighborhoods generationally. And I do think, and we're still very much in the infancy of this, so that the, the number of visual returns on it are still slim, I understand that. But we have our first comprehensive plan in the city of Memphis in 40 years, just adopted last year, Memphis 3.0. And, you know, I know some people you look at that and you say, okay, Memphis 3.0, comprehensive plan. I don't know what that is. I get it. Like, I understand it's, it's, it, it's, it's a big, thick booklet. But the point that, that I like to, to make about Memphis 3.0 is, you know, city government under the leadership of Mayor Strickland has uh, a true roadmap for investing in areas um, that have not seen it in far too long. And, you know, it, it, it's hard to describe it. But I can tell you that we frequently have conversations here in City Hall, whether it's, you know, Doug and, and me or Doug and John Zena or me or Paul Young or, or Joanne. My goodness, Joanne, I talk about this a lot, is um, wouldn't it be nice if we do this thing, whatever that may be? And then the next question, now that we have Memphis 3.0, is, okay, what is a community anchor we could do that in? And, you know, that, that's a small item but you start doing that and you start incorporating that into the culture of city government and I think um, you can really start to get on a roll and, and I think we're beginning to see the start of that here. You know well, I, think I, I, I agree with that Kyle you know there are a lot of think tanks out there but there aren't a lot of do tanks and, and what, what I love about the 3.0 plan is that it, it, you see it becoming operationalized you see it becoming activated in the communities at the neighborhood level where it matters most. So, uh, you know, we, we say all the time at the university, we're driven by doing, and, and that's what's so exciting about contributing to the overall effort of uh, you know, what the leadership has committed to and driven, um, you know, is, is getting things done. And, uh, you know, it's gonna take that, that effort now more than ever, uh, given that we're in this pandemic and, and uh, you know, and 
you know, the, the focus on social justices and, and the civil unrest because people aren't comfortable with that. But I, I think, I think everyone can agree on responding to our efforts collectively uh, where we are giving them attention that they desperately desire and, and deserve. And to me, that's where you're going to see the shift in the seeds of, of all of this growth. Um, that's exciting. I, I think Memphis's future is brighter than ever because of that. Great. And um, Ted, I think I'm going to coin the phrase, there are a lot of think tanks and not a lot of do tanks out there. I'll send you a little plaque with that, you know, so I want to coin that phrase out. Yeah, I'm, t I'm totally going to steal that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. All of you guys are too late because I've already tweeted it. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Joanne, you can Has take Hashtag. <laughs> <clears throat> And uh, secondly, thank you, Milt. That was a great question. Ted, thanks for bringing that up and, uh, and just giving a great comprehensive answer. To follow up on something for, this is for the panelists and the attendees, uh, to follow up on something that Ted mentioned, the Smart Cities Research Cluster, uh, part of what the Institute does is the interdisciplinary uh, research. And we have seven clusters focused on areas like Smart Cities, our collaboration with the city of Memphis, cybersecurity, data science, uh, drones, autonomous vehicles, and robotics, um, and a number of other areas, biologistics is, is not to be forgotten. But you can go on our website, which is memphis.edu slash FedEx, and you can uh, take a look at the research, research that's being done here at the Institute, but then as a whole within the entire division of research and innovation, as Ted said, you know, our executive VP of, uh, of research and innovation, Dr. Jasbeer Dollywall, he's been leading the effort for the university to reach this Carnegie research level one, which is the highest tier possible, because it opens up so many more avenues for research funding. And, you know, it looks like we're on track to reach that uh, goal here. So that's great. That's great. And so far, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to, like I said, ask them in the Q&A box, ask them in the chat box. Um, with, this is more, this is a very open session. Feel free to ask any questions you can, and we'll pose them to the panelists as, um, as we can. Again, open to everybody here. Um, what local innovations have you guys seen or, or what innovations do you see coming out of this time that we would not have seen had this, you know, something like this not struck? So whoever wants to take the first stab at it, go ahead, please. It's open to everybody. So um, I'm impressed with the resiliency and the response of Shelby County school system. Um, you know, Dr. Ray, uh, his team deserves a lot of credit for, um, you know, they just passed, their board passed the um, implementation of one-to-one -one devices for every um, student. You know, this is one of those opportunities that um, took a pandemic to get us to a place that we would have loved to be in all along. And so, as, as someone once said, never um, allow a crisis to go to waste. Um, having our large school system, 100,000 students, able to have um, a device and connectivity, that's just an amazing opportunity for um, increased learning and an opportunity to you know, really leverage some of the um, teachers that may have specialties. Now you can have more students served by um, you know, that one or a few teachers with that particular specialty. And so uh, that's one innovation that I've seen, having the wherewithal to recognize that here's an opportunity for us to do something great, do something that we would have loved to do all along. Um, and then the collaboration that I'm seeing uh, throughout the community. Um, as I said, it, it, I don't take it for granted. Um, I, I look to see where we leverage that collaboration for um, for projects in, in, in the post-COVID era. Well, I mean, I'll add kind of along those same lines. It truly is the virtual environment that we see ourselves not just um, main, you know, not just being involved in, but actually thriving in. Uh, you know, we asked the question about where are we and are we working virtually? What are the flexible schedules? 
um, the university. I'm so impressed. And um, to Ernest's point, I also serve on the SES reentry committee wearing one of my many hats, uh, that hat as a parent of two rising seniors at White Station High. And it's two of them because they're twins, uh, Brianna and Bianca, shout out to them. But <laughs> nevertheless, they will be seniors in the fall. And so as the parent representative on that committee, seeing the way that the school system was able to shift and they've already actually done that. The twins are now taking classes at Southwest uh, online during the summertime, and they're getting certification through the employee uh, program with Ike Griffin with the city of Memphis, the university and what they're doing. And as both girls are looking at different schools, it's now much more wide open and the options are such where the universities are taking into consideration that virtual environment and allowing students to be able to uh, attend virtually is just amazing. So I think that although we've said it before and, and, I, and I like Ted's, you know, think tank versus the do tank, we really truly are doing so much, um, I know in this community, but across the nation to uh, break down systemic uh, barriers that challenges that have existed for so many years uh, for people because of lack of access to resources and earnest mission those uh, specialty teachers, all of those things are really changing. So I'm very hopeful on the other side of this country will be something very, very different. And that's a good thing. Um, Rami, I, I think I will point to, you know, an innovation that was born out of, uh, you know, a direct response to COVID. And that came out of the FedEx Institute of Technology with the ND2K, um, mm -hmm. developing a, a, a mobile app that, uh, that tracks uh, social distancing. Um, so, you know, I, I guess that that mother of invention, if you will, in, in addressing this um, was something that was quickly mobilized and, and launched uh, to to address this. But I think you'll see more and more of that ripple effect of innovation, as it always does, uh, when there is a, a, a need that's, in this case, accelerated and influenced by incredible pressures and a very expectant global audience to deliver on solutions. Um, and, a, you know, in another hat that I wear as chairman of Life Science Tennessee, and Milt knows this, I mean, the whole world is looking at that industry and asking for the delivery of tests and a vaccine to treat and a vaccine to prevent something like this from ever happening again. And, and so, um, you know, the University of Memphis has played a role in that directly. We've seen that already. Um, and also collaborating with UT Health Science Center here locally to, to uh, focus on this. So you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, we're taking a, an unfortunate situation, addressing it with technology and innovation. Uh, and, and the advances of that will, will create a multiplier effect, but you're going to see it augment. And, you know, daily technologies that we'll realize and benefit from five and 10 years from now uh, will have come and, and been spurred upon, uh, you know, this pandemic. Yeah, and I also think of all of the, the tiny innovations that we see every day that we may not even, I, sometimes I have to um, sit back and think about what, are, what was the staff meeting that led to this being a new delivery model for this product in this time in our history. And I don't, I, I truly mean that less from, you know, um, uh, bioscience to, I mean that, how did, you know, Huey showed, you know, a, a great amount of, uh, of, um, of innovation, if you want to call it that, in terms of now they have numbered parking spots when I pull up to get my food and you, you text to, to tell them you're there and, I remember the first time I went to, I think, Slider Inn, and, you know, you, you pulled in, and you're like, man, numbered parking spots. And, yeah. again, that's not that's not revolutionary, but um, to I see. I don't know, but the Jameson, the Jameson slushy is revolutionary. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt about that. The Jameson slushy may have caused some of the evolutionary. 
<laughs> it's been a it's been a great contributor to the economy. <laughs> I, I will say, if you just look at our restaurant industry in particular, um, you know that they, they're not the first folks to ever invent a delivery model where you pull into a number parking spot. I don't mean that, but the fact that so many of our folks in this so it's a very critical industry to any big city's economy. I think ours in particular, it's part of our identity um, that are able to adapt and change on a dime because um, because they have to certainly um, as opposed to the alternative. I, I just think that sometimes we may take for granted some of these small adaptations that um, that are happening, and we'll see how many of them last. You know, and we'll see how many of them are. Uh, because of the temporary nature of the business or that, hmm, this actually is a better service delivery model uh, that we stumbled across. And uh, I'm, I'm really curious from that standpoint, what we'll be looking up and seeing in a year or two or three that was born out of this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to guess Huey's is your favorite restaurant, by the way. You mentioned them by name and early you know, <laughs> locals. So. I love Huey's and I happen to live pretty close to the one in Midtown. So it's, it's nice. convenient as well. It's a favorite of my household as well. My wife is from New York City, and uh, she was asked recently by someone, she goes, what's your favorite restaurant been since you've moved? You know, she's been here for four years, and without a second's hesitation, she's like, oh, Huey's, Huey's. Not barbecue, not anything else. She just, without hesitation, said, Huey's. I would eat there all the time if I could. And I'm like, no, that's okay. We don't have to eat there. I love Huey's too, but not all the time. Like, that's, it's okay. <laughs> Apparently, One, we're getting close to lunchtime. Everybody's talking about food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or, have, or happy hour, either one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, only I only have a uh, one or two more questions for you guys. I know we have to wrap up here pretty soon, but you know, with things starting to open back up, speaking of like the restaurant industry and just you know the economies, it looks like states are starting to open things back up, and we're seeing some spikes and some breakouts, and certain hotspots are shifting now from say New York. You know, there's a potential for Florida to become kind of the new hotspot area for COVID. What are organizations or what are you seeing that organizations are prepping for in case we go, you know, do we shift back to a completely quarantine model? Do we do some type of hybrid quarantine model? What are, what are you guys seeing or what are your organizations preparing for kind of for the next say six months? You know, we've got six months left in the year. It's six months till Christmas almost, by the way, just, you know, throwing that out there too. Um, six months and one week almost, right? So, uh, what do you see your organizations doing or have you seen organizations doing overall? Well, I'll start from, from just a governmental standpoint. Um, certainly we, you know, we look at the data and by we, I, I do mean probably more the health department and the hospitals and, and Chief McGowan and, and um, that section of the task force. You're looking at the data every day, um, multiple times a day to see what cases and hospitalizations, et cetera, et cetera, are. So uh, while so much of this is um, unpredictable because this is novel, doesn't mean it's not trackable and that you can't make informed decisions about it. So I feel very confident in terms of leadership's ability to, uh, to have the right data to make the right decisions. Um, it is impossible to forecast, we know that, um, but we can make some educated decisions based on the data. And, and I think that's, you know, for good or bad, um, we're just going to be in this phase where um, we have to be nimble, we have to be smart, we have to keep public health the number one priority. Fortunately, one of the one of the key areas of emphasis for the Joint Task Force very early on, particularly in the first few weeks, was to uh, first off increase our supply of personal protective equipment, which um, I feel like we we we've done that. And then also uh, to, um, to increase the capacity of our hospital system. And you see that with uh, the incredible partnership with the state and the Corps of Engineers with the, build, the former commercial appeal building. So, um, you know, we don't know what the future will hold, but I feel like we're in a much more prepared spot than we were um, in mid-March for sure. Great, great. Ernest, what have you seen both within the chamber? How are you guys preparing for you know, potential spikes or a second wave, as they're calling it. Um, are you guys looking to continue on with some of the programs and initiatives that you guys have started, or is there something else in the pipeline that we should look forward to? Yeah, we're, we're remaining nimble. Um, we have found that we are able to be uh, effective working remotely, and so we'll keep 
uh, this remote work going for uh, a little while longer. Um, we are also committed to being at Information Central, providing up to minute, up to the minute information uh, for our, our members. Uh, for instance, our business resource page, just the immediate jobs section of that page alone received over 30,000 unique views. And so now that we've opened up these channels, we've um, gained this digital real estate where the community is looking for us for accurate information. We'll, we will definitely maintain um, providing um, that information and serving as that hub so that uh, you're not having to you know, run over to the health department to find out what's going on. And then what is the governor stating? And then what is the mayor stating? We're kind of um, organizing ourselves to synthesize all of that information and provide it in a clear and concise manner uh, to our members and, as well as to the general public. Um, inside of our offices, we're looking at, you know, different social, uh, I, I don't like the word social distancing. I like physical distancing. We, we, yeah. we remain social with one another, but physical distancing. Uh, so we're, we're taking precautions to organize our office uh, in such a way where we can limit the number of individuals. Um, we're relying more on virtual meetings as opposed to <clears throat> those in-person meetings that we were so uh, married to. And when we do have in-person meetings, in-person meetings, we're limiting the number of folks that we're inviting to those. So um, all of, of those measures are our attempts to uh, be prepared, be flexible, should spikes occur, causing us to revert back to um, a phase one um, type of environment. That's true. Great, great to hear that. And Ted, before you jump, before you jump in, you and I are in a unique position, I believe, because within the higher education system, like we, within the University of Memphis, we, we're kind of in this bubble almost, you know, we, we've got this such a, an insular where people come on campus and they either come on campus and leave or they come on campus and then they stay. You know, they stay for a while, they have multiple classes. And I'm lucky enough to be on one of the groups that's trying to mitigate risk for on-campus classes in the fall. And there were so many little minute details to, to think of, but I, I'd like to hear your perspective on all that, and then I can speak a little more to that. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, just like with everyone, the, the, uh, the onset of this pandemic forced a lot of really quick action. And, uh, you know, so our students went on spring break. Uh, we, we saw the, the, uh, the impact of this and what, where it was going, and, and so, we extended spring break by a week uh, to prepare and, and identify what our strategy would be moving forward. And uh, in that time period, as I mentioned earlier in, in this, uh, you know, we converted to a fully online format with student safety and, and campus um, staff safety being the focus uh, of that, right? Um, so, uh, but we, we remained open uh, in the sense that uh, 700 of our students uh, were in housing and uh, many of them face uh, housing and food insecurities and we, uh, we wanted to protect them not only from uh, you know, the, the virus but also those other uh, factors that, that um, could become threats to them uh, personally. So, uh, you know, I'm extremely proud of of the efforts of, of the entire campus community that came together and, and you know, converted over, what, 3,000 courses to an online format. Um, you know, the, the whole faculty embraced this and supported it and supported our students to finish the semester strong and, and uh, many, many of those uh, moving on to graduation. Um, but we've remained under this very cautious, thoughtful posture um, to ensure that, that we have the safest environment possible. Uh, we're looking at a multi-phase reopening as well, and you mentioned it, you know, 25% now and, and uh, phasing into that um, as, as, you know, it allows. Um, 
we're, we've got multiple work groups that we formed that have talked about reopening and, and what that would look like from a facility standpoint to a student support standpoint. Um, but everything continued to flow, student aid, everything. We, we focused and, and we're centered on student success. And all of the wrappers that we've built over time have remained in place, if not grown stronger. Um, so we will come back. Um, we hope that, that we can maintain that um, the opening a week early, uh, mm -hmm. working through fall break, um, still observing Labor Day, which other universities are not. Um, and I think I'm going to use that as a recruiting tool. We're, we're like the best. <laughs> you at least get Labor Day. Um, but finishing uh, early at, at the Thanksgiving holiday yeah. and then doing all exams online. I think that's pretty standard from what we see of universities across the country. Uh, and then having that break between, you know, Thanksgiving and, and the spring semester, which will hopefully start in January. But yeah, uh, that's, that's what we've been focused on. Just not having to rush out there and get our plan out there, but, you know, to look at the data, uh, let, let data form our, our strategy and, uh, and then, you know, be guided by the principles and, and values that we hold near and dear. Yeah, and I can follow up on that being on, like I said, on that, uh, that work group that's looking to mitigate on campus risk. As Ted mentioned, this is for all the panelists and all the attendees. You know, we went to that model where we said, okay, we're going to shift back, you know, school starting a week early, you know, all the stuff Ted said, but, you know, it's more about on, on campus risk as well. So it's limiting the number of people on campus. It's, you know, whether it's PPE, or personal protective equipment, whether it's, you know, those in higher risk categories trying to sit there and, you know, think of their needs and the vulnerability, need, uh, the needs of the most vulnerable. So there is still a lot to be considered. And, you know, this is this pandemic by no by no means is over. But um, I'll get you guys out here. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'll get you out here on this on one last question. And it's a positive note. I feel like we kind of were positive And then we talked about Huey's, which was really positive, And, you know, let's, let's end on another positive note here. And then you remind everybody it's holiday shopping time, right? Yeah, that's you. So, yeah but, it's not, but it's not. But crazy. we should all go to we should all go to Cynthia Cynthia's website. We yeah. get our holiday shopping done that's now. Linked down in the June chat. Yep. yep, that's, that's linked down in the chat. So that's been great. Great. Thank you guys for everything. On that note, what guys? What has brought you hope during this whole time? A lot of people talk about the kind of mental and emotional kind of uh, issues that have been creeping up during these times, people felt isolated or people felt like, you know, I've not gotten the interaction I'm used to getting on a daily basis, but what brings you guys hope during this time? And uh, Ernest, I'll start with you. Yeah, again, thanks for uh, inviting me to participate in, in the panel. Um, what brings me hope is um, the paradigm shift that we're seeing. Uh, we, we hear the words new normal, right? Um, well, the old normal, as you can see by all the uprisings that are taking place in our community and across the nation, the old normal uh, wasn't working so well. And so having a new normal uh, is, is something that's inspiring uh, for me. It's also inspiring to see how resilient we are. Like we have never been through anything quite like this before. And we made it, you know, for the most part, um, you know, our economy took some bumps and bruises. Um, There's a lot of um, pain associated with, you know, COVID, uh, but we're, we're still here. We're still thinking about ways of improving our community. And I'm one that feels, you know, once you go through something, it, it makes you, you know, stronger. It makes you more resilient. And so I'm optimistic that um, our community was able to go through something uh, such as this pandemic, and and still not you know be um, in, in such dire strait that um, such dire strait that one would have predicted if they would have imagined this type of scenario. So I'm I'm happy that you know um, our community is, is resilient and thinking of ways to uh, create better new norms. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, Joanne, next. I'd like to ask you next. Uh, yeah, so it's been mentioned about um, all of the different 
innovations that have occurred, the strategies to address uh, economic uh, development in our community. And like Cal mentioned, and I think um, Ernest did as well, there's still a real strong interest in industry growing in our community with what you guys are doing at the university to um, outside recruitment. There are millions and millions of dollars that are still being spent in Memphis. And so what gives me hope is that I know that those opportunities are there and that uh, business in Memphis will continue to thrive. And the other thing that gives me hope is I've seen from the very first uh, day when this pandemic happened in our community, how our community members have rallied around each other, how they rallied around restaurants and with the mayor's uh, initiative to, you know, go to lunch. And I think it was lunch on the mayor or something like that. And I, I did it a couple of times and Huey's was my choice uh, mm -hmm. a couple of times. But uh, the way that our community has rallied around each other and even with us being here now, we could all simply sit on our hands and say, we can't do what we used to do anymore. And so we're just going to wait this out. But Memphis isn't one to give up. And I'm a really proud Memphian, born and raised here, like most of the folks um, that are probably on this call. And I know most of the panel, we're not, we don't give up. And so what gives me hope is that I know that we're only going to be stronger on the other side. And we're going to be doing that together, as we always have. Part of that grit and grind mentality that our Grizzlies, you know, instilled in all of us for the last 10 plus years. So I agree with that completely, Joanne. Uh, Kyle, I'll follow up with you. <clears throat> sure. And, um, and I'll say, Rami, thank you. And Ted, thank you for uh, inviting me and, and um, for what all you guys are engaged in every day at the University of Memphis. Um, it's, it, that is inspiring to see what's going on uh, at the U of M. Uh, both in terms of when I'm over there and I see the progress in brick and mortar. And then when I hear you guys talk about, you know, the progress and um, it, it's amazing. And so I, I want to make sure that it's said. Uh, I am a little, um, I'm appreciative of what Ernest and Joanne said and a little jealous because that's what I was going to say. And they said it much better. Uh, I, <laughs> well, have, uh, I have seen, um, the thing that gives me hope is certainly the collaborative efforts that we've had and also uh, the amount of activity that continues that we continue to deal with. If we were sitting around here twiddling our thumbs because there were no projects, uh, I'd be I'd be <clears throat> hard time answering that question professionally, and that's not the case. So, uh, no doubt, um, the resiliency of Memphis in the face of this unprecedented time, but also resiliency in a recognition that I think Ernest, you said it quite well that that the old normal wasn't working for a lot of people. And so the fact that um, we're having to change a lot of things because of a pandemic and because business has to change um, in an era where we're, we're having to and, and needing to and wanting to um, change because we're seeing social conditions that we can't justify um, that, that are wrong and that, that need to change. And that's all happening at the same time to see how Memphis is coming together and being resilient in that is uh, absolutely gives me hope. Great, that's, that's excellent, that's very true. And Ted, certainly last but not least. Sure, uh, thank you again, Rami and Marianne and, and the folks at FedEx Institute for organizing this. I think it's a, a really important conversation. What gives me hope, I'll, I'll cite three things. Uh, when I'm feeling down in the dumps um, and I'm on campus, I just simply walk around and look at the students. And, and uh, that reminds me of, of why we do what we do, uh, even in the face of maybe challenging times. Uh, they inspire and they provide me hope uh, because they represent and embody the future of this community. Um, another thing that provides me hope is the fact that uh, we've seen double digit uh, increase in, in summer enrollment. <laughs> um, so aside from the revenue, uh, what that tells me is that folks are looking at the university. They're turning to it uh, to help themselves. Uh, maybe some coming back to school for the first time in a long time. 
Um, but there, there is a, a you know a, a safety and security in that uh, uh, that represents the increased enrollment in, in summer numbers, and I'm hoping that that translates into fall. And every indication is that it will. Um, in a time when our peers in the state are either at flat or uh, uh, declining enrollment in summer numbers, we're up double digit, ni almost 19 19 percent. Tremendous. That's hope. Um, and I think um, I'll punctuate that hope with the fact that uh, the University of Memphis, and I'm really proud of our response to all of this, the pandemic and, and uh, you know, the, the social injustices. And again, we are driven by doing. And a lot of universities have come out with statements. But we came out with a scholarship honoring and in the name of George Floyd. And to me, I think that's a, a declaration of hope and promise and commitment. And um, so I'll end with that. Great. And thank you for mentioning that, Ted. That's a, a, a nice little bow. I'll open the floor up to any of the panelists if they'd like to add anything else, any ending words or thoughts, anything like that. Well, Rami, if I could, I um, meant to also mention when I talked about those millions of dollars and you know, activity and projects on Tuesday, the city of Memphis will host its fifth We Mean Business Symposium, but it'll be virtual. It's online. You can go to OBDC events uh, to find it. Anybody is welcome to sign up. And again, there'll be millions of dollars in contract opportunities, everything from janitorial to engineering and architecture and all kinds of construction projects, goods and supplies. But it'll also be City of Memphis, Shelby County Schools, Memphis Airport, Downtown Memphis Commission, TVA, Turner Construction, all of those companies and more will be presenting projects. So I hope that everyone can join. And if you are not a business owner, uh, please share it on your social media and with your friends. We have a capacity up to 1,000 people that can attend. And Mayor Strickland will kick that off at 830. Great. And I believe Ashley Robinson, thank you for linking that um, in the Q&A session. For those who are interested, they can uh, and want to listen to this talk uh, as well, again, to get this information, all the websites, all the information, it will be posted on our website, memphis.edu slash FedEx. So you can go there and we'll be able to post this online. But is there anything else from any of the panelists? All right. Well, Happy, fa happy Father's Day to all the dads. Yeah. yeah. Happy Father's Day. And be sure to uh, send a bill to Huey's for all this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they love Thanks the Thanks to the event catered by. Yeah. yeah, there you go. All right, thank you for everyone uh, who was able to attend. And thank you guys as a panelist, Joanne, Kyle, Ernest, and Ted. Thank you guys so much. And uh, we'll chat with everyone soon. Thank you. Thank you. All right, take care. Be safe, everyone.